And so what I decided to do, this is kind of a uh, general title, because I was kind of going back and forth trying to decide what it was that I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, it's very rare that I get, you know, any more than 15 or 20 minutes to talk about my research, and so I wanted to really make sure that this counted. And so I decided to kind of take a look back, a flashback Friday, if you will, and kind of talk about the mathematical journey that I've kind of taken that I've had a chance to, you know, by piece by piece, disseminate through most or many of the CARM conferences that I've had a chance to go on. And so for people that have seen me speak or know me, know that I usually talk about the Kamasa home equation. That's been my baby for the last six or seven years. And what started as a, what we thought was going to be a small analysis problem, turned into this very kind of big ballooning analysis problem problem, then we looked at generalizations, and finally right now I'm working on applications, and so I like to consider myself finally as an applied mathematician. And so the story so far, as I mentioned before, the very first CARMS that I went to was CARM 17 at UCLA and had a chance to talk about the so-called convergence of a particle method and global weak solutions for a family of evolutionary PDEs. And so I started with a family of PDEs, but embedded inside that PDE is the very famous, well-studied Kamasa home equation. And so I was probably in my third year of graduate school. This was the very first result I had ever obtained. Was super excited about it, came to CARMS was fortunate enough to give a talk about it. But one thing that was sort of always in the back of my mind is where do I go from here? You know, how do people, I guess, make a career out of mathematics? What other kind of problems can I possibly study? Or, you know, is it possible to even turn this into a thesis or a dissertation? You know, probably the usual worries that many grad students have, or maybe I was alone in that. But in any case, that was, you know, an internal struggle of mine for a while. And then I came back a couple of years later uh, here at Princeton and talked about uh, some more or a different type of work, but still within the same realm of the Kamasa home equation. And so we kind of talked about these so-called elastic collisions among PECON solutions for the Kamasa home equation. And then finally last year, I kind of switched gears a little bit and started looking at a generalization of the Kamasa home equation. So this so-called invariant preserving, whoops, uh, finally different schemes for the Kamasa home equation, the two component Kamasa home equation. And so just to kind of give you an idea of how all of this kind of transpired, how did I jump from one topic to the next? Where was I? Where have I been? Where am I going? Where am I taking this? I decided to kind of take this hour to kind of go back, look at some of the things that I've talked about in the previous CARM conferences, and then if time permits, talk about what I hope to do in the future, what I'm currently working on now, both with uh, some of my colleagues and even a couple of students uh, at Drake University. And so the equation that, I, or I guess the family of equations that I've been fascinated with for uh, what seems like forever now, is the so-called B family of transport equations. So it's a family of uh, strongly nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs, some derived in the context of shallow water wave theory. You will see that it's characterized by this momentum M, this velocity U, this bifurcation parameter B, which has to be strictly greater than one, and it kind of provides a balance between the linear dispersion and the nonlinear terms. And if you get that balance just right, you can actually generate a very special uh, type and class of solutions that we'll take some time and talk about. The Kamasa home equation, if you're curious, is generated when b is equal to 2. Uh, there is this very nice relationship between the momentum and the velocity given through this one-dimensional hem host operator. Alpha is just simply a length scale here. And there are very many types of applications that many people have studied with regards to these particular within the realm of shallow water waves, but you can also talk about computational anatomy, mechanical vibrations, and so forth and so on. And so there are a couple of properties that's going to be pertinent to this talk today and pertinent to what we study. In particular, they have a very special type traveling wave solution given in this form here. And so this is in terms of velocity u. And what you can kind of see is that here we're talking about PDEs, but we have this absolute value here. And so what you will immediately is that we cannot talk about classical strong solutions. We have to formulate a weak type of problem because there is a discontinuity that manifests from the first derivative of this traveling wave solution. As I mentioned before, the Kamasa home equation is given when b is equal to 2. The Kamasa home equation, so this b equals 2, is almost a perfect bifurcation parameter because it gives almost the correct ratio to generate a special class of solutions, and we'll talk a little bit about why the Kamasa home equation is so special with regards to this B family of transport equations. For B equals 2 and B equals 3, it's also completely integrable. Completely integrable means lots of different things to lots of different mathematicians. If you talk to an algebraist, he will say that it has a lax pair of 
opportunity that you can get into the concept of Poisson brackets. If you talk to a PD guy like me, I will say that completely integrable means that it has infinitely many conservation laws. And so from those infinitely many conservation laws, you can take a look at some particular ones of interest and try to conserve it. This, of course, is the total energy with regards to the Kamasa home equation. And that will, of course, uh, at some point, become very important to what it is that we would like to do, what we would like to talk about. And so I mentioned that those traveling wave solutions are special. They generate a phenomenon or a type of solution called a solitone. And in fact, because you have that discontinuity in the first derivative, you have a peak there. And so sometimes we call that pecons, which is an amalgamation of a peaked soliton. And so by soliton, generally what we mean, we mean it has a wave, it represents a wave of permanent form, it is localized, and it can undergo a very strong, complicated interaction among other solitons. And this hallmark feature is that it will retain its identity after it undergoes this so-called the so-called interaction. And let's kind of give you an example of what I mean by that. Say I start with two so-called pecans. One has a higher height. The height is intrinsically related to the speed, and so we expect this one to move a little bit faster than this one, and so at some point, it should overtake the smaller solitone. If you continue to take snapshots of this as time goes on, you see that they start to move closer to each other. They undergo some kind of complicated nonlinear interaction, and then they kind of appear to separate almost unscathed. There is certainly a possible uh, phase shift in this nonlinear interaction, but nonetheless, they retain their identity as they pass by. And so you can see that there is some type of collision that goes on between these two solitons. And in part of my study, we want to try and understand and figure out what type of interaction can we actually quantify what is going on when these two pecans interact with each other. And so if you saw probably a couple of slides ago, I think that was Karma's 20, where I finally had a chance to talk about that and realize what type of potential what's happening here with regards to these two solutions. And so the very first thing that I did, so like I said, it's kind of going back, and my first, I guess, uh, uh, four way into the Kamasa home equation was to kind of study it from an analytical perspective. And so we were given the goal of trying to prove the existence and uniqueness of a global weak solution. Weak because you have those discontinuities in the first derivative, so it makes sense to talk about it with regards to that, of the B family of transport equations, noticing that the Kamasa home equation is certainly embedded in there. And so, of course, to do that, the very first thing we have to do is try to figure out or derive a weak solution to the so-called B family of transport equations. And so, PDs 101, as soon as you want to talk about a weak solution, the very first thing you do, take a test function, so an infinitely differentiable function with compact support, you integrate it, and then you use integration by parts to move all of the derivatives from the PDE onto this test function, recalling that I have this very nice relationship between the momentum and the velocity through this one-dimensional Helmholtz operator. And if you do everything I just said, integration by parts, move the derivatives over to the test function, you get exactly this as a weak solution to your PDE. So when I'm looking for that global weak solution for the Kamasa home equation, I'm looking for a solution that satisfies this quantity. And so where does that weak solution come from? How do I establish it? Where or what mathematical tools do I have at my disposal to come up with this? Turns out, so this is just kind of a theorem that says exactly that. We were able to show the existence of set solutions to that B family of transport equations. And notice that here, we have a very nice regularity with regards to that. We have here this BV that stands for bounded variation. I will spend some time on this talk talking about that. And notice that the velocity we show is continuous under this H1 or Hilbert norm. The way to do that is kind of in this sort of what I think is an interesting way. Even though I'm doing analysis, I'm actually going to derive a numerical method to try and solve this B family transport equation. The numerical method that we will talk about here is the so-called particle method. From then, I will show that that particle solution that I generate from this particle method that I've derived for this B family of transport equations is, in fact, a weak to the B family of transport equations. Once I do that, I'm going to actually show that that particle solution, as n tends to infinity, will converge to something. But what should that something be? Hopefully, if we play this game correctly, that something's going to be exactly that global weak solution that I'm looking for here. 
And hopefully, once I get this global weak solution, I can then establish the so-called regularity results with regards to this UNM that we get from this convergence of this particle method. So that's the game we play to establish this global weak solution. And so first thing is first, I got to derive the so-called particle method for the B family of fluid transport equations. And so what is the particle method? Essentially, I'm going to assume the solution, a weak formulation of the solution, because I'm dealing with these so-called direct delta distributions. And so remember that it's a distribution, which is the same thing as saying a generalized function. And so you can think of it as a function that has zero everywhere, except that at the origin, kind of this energy pulse. So it's kind of like infinity at that point, which of course does not make sense in the classical sense, which is why we're doing everything uh, using a weak formulation. Once again, makes sense because we have those weak solutions, i.e. those pecans. And so this was a uh, paragon that we're working with in regards to here. Notice that if I assume this as my particle solution, a linear combination of direct, direct delta distributions with a particular location for the particle, a particular weight for the particle, and then the number of particles that I choose to do here, and keeping in mind that if I'm going to have to prove convergence or try and prove convergence, I'm going to show that as this n goes to infinity, this solution is going to converge to something that solves the kamasa home equation, or in general, the B family of transport equations. And so I see that as soon as I assume this, I need a way to evolve the locations, and, or excuse me, evolve the locations here and evolve the weights here. The ways you do that, you can solve a corresponding system of ordinary differential equations that's derived by plugging in that solution into the B family of transport equations. As soon as you do that, out pops the system of ODEs that you can evolve in order to figure out the location at time t and the weights at time t. You will notice that the ODEs have something to do with the solution that I actually don't have access to just yet. That's the velocity here and the derivative of the velocity. And so at first you panic, and then you remember, oh, that's right, the momentum is related to the velocity through this one-dimensional Hemholtz operator. I have assumed a solution for the momentum. Therefore, by inverting this, I can get explicit expressions for both the velocity and its first derivative, keeping in mind that we certainly will have the sine function because of this discontinuity that emanates from this absolute value term here. And of course, the only thing I guess I need to be worried about, now that I'm dealing with trying to solve the system of ODEs, I need to make sure that a solution will exist at any time here. Because as soon as the solution doesn't exist here, the particle method immediately will break down. Because then I have no way to evolve the location or the weights. And so it turns out that we do have a nice existence theorem for that particular ODE system. I will mention that in just a second. But even more important, Notice that this, and this will play an important role in what we do later on, the total momentum of the particle system is always conserved. It's actually also physically relevant. So when they derived this B-family transport equations, they found that out themselves when they were deriving this and the energy as well. It's always conserved. And so our particle system matches that same idea. And so that worked out quite nice for us. We also have positivity preserving uh, Result here with regards to the initial momentum, if it, stays, if it begins positive, it will remain positive. And as long as I assume that with regards to the initial momentum, I can guarantee that that system of ODEs that I mentioned beforehand will always have a solution, which is of course equivalent to saying that no two particles can occupy the same position at any finite time. So I have this particle method. I know that as long as the initial momentum is positive, I can always generate a solution, so that's not a problem at all. And so finally, I need to just verify that that particle solution that I've generated, this as a linear combination of direct delta distributions, this getting the exact solution from the relationship between the momentum and the velocity, I can actually show that this is a weak solution to the B family of transport equations. And it turns out that, so I won't go through the proof here, but it turns out that's actually not too bad to do if you just directly substitute this assumed solution and what you know for you into this B family of transport equations into that definition of a weak solution. Everything works out quite nicely here. And so, so far, so good. 
The tricky part, though, is how you actually get the convergence. So I will mention that before we started working on this, for the Kamas home equation, that's, one, that's an equation that's been extensively studied. Lots of work has been done on it. Uh, I, of course, have done uh, a good amount of work done on it as well. The convergence results had already have been well established for the Kamasa home equation for B equals two and the DP equation for B equals three. We were thinking, well, what if we try to extend that to just the whole entire B family of transport equations? An immediate issue that comes with doing that is that if you remember a couple of slides ago, I mentioned that when B is equal to two and when B is equal to three, those two equations are completely integrable. And so you can actually take that to your advantage use that to establish the convergence results for the Kamasa home equation and the DP equation? My claim is that if I look at any other B, greater than one, besides two and three, I lose complete integrability. And then right after that, none of those convergence results that worked out so nicely for the Kamasa home equation or the DP equation are valid. If we had to kind of come up with an entirely new way to try to prove convergence so that we can get the existence of that global weak solution, and we decided to use the help of this concept of bounded variation or functions of bounded variation in space and time. Why would we want to use that? Well, if I can show that U is a function of bounded variation, those set of functions form a compact set. If I have a set that is compact, you might remember from analysis that guarantees the existence of a convergent subsequence. I will take that subsequence and I will just reorder it. And that will be the sequence that will converge to something. And then I will also show that, that something that it converges to is a global weak solution. As a bonus, and you will see once we get to that slide where we once again look at that weak solution, if I have a function of bounded variation, it's also bounded under the L infinity norm. And so when I have an integral, if I have a term that I need to pull out, I can certainly do that as long as it's a function of bounded variation. So that's kind of our thinking. We decided to go this route and try to show bounded variation. And so you see here, this is just talking about that so-called compactness result to establish that convergence. And once I get that convergence, all that's left to do is verify that that thing it converges to is in fact a unique global weak solution to the B family of transport equations. And so you see here, this is exactly the problem. This is what I'm trying to do. This is the convergence that I'm looking for here. And so I mentioned that compactness also, what it will allow us to do, because there was an integral here, will allow me to pass the limit through. Very nice property by compactness that we will use to our advantage. And here, I've highlighted this red term here, because this was probably the most complicated term to deal with in proving convergence. Here, factor this, use the fact that un and, to use the fact that un and u, there are functions of bounded variation. They are bounded by the L infinity norm, so you can pull it out. Pull it out pass the limit in, use compactness to get a convergent subsequence. And so if I can do all three of those things, I should be good to go here. And if this term works, everything else should follow pretty nicely. And so I've said bounded variation a couple of times, so it behooves me to give a definition of what I mean when I say you have a function of bounded variation. Essentially, you take a look at all the possible partitions over some particular interval, take the absolute value, look at the difference, sum them up. If this soup is finite, that tells you that the total variation of U is bounded. If it is bounded, then you have a function of bounded variation. And what works out very nicely for us is that here are the green functions associated with the one-dimensional Helmholtz operator that you might remember or recall is what relates the velocity with the momentum. Well, these functions are BV functions, functions of bounded variation. The variation of this, I think, is one over alpha. And so that's going to take care of the green function here. And then you may also remember I'm left with, this is a constant, left with the sum of these PI terms. But you may have also remembered that this sum is conserved, so it's also constant. And so just like that, I can show velocity in this first derivative, our functions of bounded variation in space. To get it in time, because we do need it in time as well to make this work, you just need to establish a Lipschitz continuity result, which we're able to do. And so you can actually show that these two functions are BV functions in two variables, both space and time. And that's what gets you the convergence. And that's what gets you the global weak solution, because it will satisfy 
this relation here, if it satisfies this relation, notice then that M and U must be, in fact, a weak solution, because this is our definition of a weak solution to the B family of transport equations. And so just like that, we're able to establish our main result, which tells me that the B family of fluid transport equations not only have a global weak solution for any parameter B greater than one, but also has a regularity where U is continuous under the H1 norm, and the velocity in its first derivative are now functions of bounded variation. And so the first columns, that was the first result that we had ever obtained. I uh, was super excited about that. And then, of course, I was left with, now what? What else can I do with this? I have this particle method. I have the Kamasa home equation, which admittedly generates uh, probably some of the most interesting types of solutions uh, and the solution dynamic among all the B equations. And so then I figured out, well, what if I can implement this particle method and try and understand once and for all what type of collision is happening among those two pecan solutions that you saw earlier. And so then that became the next phase of this project. Instead of looking at the entire B family of transport equations, let me look at the equation that was of interest to begin with in any case, the so-called Kamasa home equation, and realize that because you have these so-called non-smooth solutions, numerical methods are particularly challenging to implement because you have that nuts smoothness that you need to take care of. And most of the methods that you derive with respect to PDEs, you use some type of smooth approximation, whether it be finite difference or finite volume or spectral method or multi-symplectic integrator. Many of those methods are okay, but they are typically computationally intensive. You usually have to take some type of adaptive time step. You need very fine grids. And so there are certainly issues that pop up we're trying to simulate that so-called pecan interaction that we talked about some time ago. In particular, if you want to look at the pecan anti-pecan, so pecan is a positive weight, anti-pecan is a negative weight. Once you have that negative initial momentum, you're no longer guaranteed a unique solution. Remember, it has to be positive in order to maintain or guarantee that. And so you have two different types of solutions that can happen when two pecans collide into each other. They either zero each other out, or they can reemerge after that using the inherent symmetry of the Kamasa home equation and then continue to propagate elsewhere. And so most numerical methods can only capture one or the other. Some can't even capture that so-called collision among a pecan and anti-pecan. But that was also another problem that we decided to kind of investigate. One of the main advantages of the particle method is the extremely low numerical diffusion due to its kind of Lagrangian nature of the particle method, as opposed to the Eulerian nature of some of the other uh, popular methods, such as a finite difference or finite volume method. And so what this will allow is for us to capture a ver variety, excuse me, of nonlinear waves in high resolution. So you may remember that when we were looking or deriving this particle method, in fact, I will try and quickly go back to that. Uh, let's see, the particle method is here. So these were the ODEs that I needed to uh, solve in order to advance or find the location and the weight, assuming that the momentum took this special form here, this linear combination of direct delta distributions. U is defined exactly like this. I'm hoping, praying in fact, that this looks familiar to you guys, because you've actually in fact have seen this type of solution before, I'm pretty sure that this is that traveling wave solution for a pecan, right? Meaning that, if I'm not mistaken, since this is the exact traveling wave solution for the velocity that we're looking for in any case, that all I need is one location and one weight to represent a pecan or to initialize a particle method for a pecan. And not only is that all it takes, I will in fact get the exact solution here where the only errors will emanate from the ODE solver that I use to advance this. And this is only true for pecan solutions, because this is, in fact, exactly what's staring us right in the face, right? Which is why, when I advance here a couple of slides later, you see that if I want to look at a two positive pecan interaction, all I need to do is evolve four ODEs, one location and one weight for one pecan, one location and one weight for the other pecan, and that's it. So what's nice about simulating pecan solutions for the particle method is that the implementation is fairly easy because of that nice relationship between the momentum and the velocity. 
And so you see here, I do exactly that. And furthermore, I can easily simulate the solution using the particle method, that's fine, but one of the things that I was really interested in trying to figure out is when they start to interact here, what in the world is happening? It turns out that this collision among these two pecans is elastic in the sense that the total momentum and energy before the interaction is the exact same as what happens after the interaction. And in fact, even though it looks like these two pecans cross here, that's exactly, if I'm looking at this without any knowledge whatsoever of the Kamasa Home equation, that's what I see. It turns out, nope, they never cross each other. In fact, what they do instead, they actually exchange momentum, telling you that the collision between these two pecans is actually through an interaction, among, an interaction potential among the Hamiltonian that is associated with this Kamasa Home equation, rather than this kind of straight heads on collision, which what it looks like here which is what happens when these two pecans collide. They actually don't collide, they interact by exchanging momentum. And so we were able to also prove this analytically. But then you may say, okay, so I see what you're saying, Terrence, but aren't you being a little bit unfair here because you're only using two pecans or two locations or two particles to stimulate this if you really want to check and make sure that, there's no two, or that no two particles are colliding into each other, shouldn't you use maybe more than two to stimulate this result and see what you get? And so, I appreciate Carlos for keeping me on my toes because you're absolutely right. I should not just kind of take for granted the fact that I only took four ODEs, two locations, and two weights to do this. And so, in fact, to really verify and to show you guys that these two particles cannot cross, let me instead do the so-called multi-particle approach, where this time I will take those same two locations and two weights, but I will take 600 different locations, and then because they don't have an effect on the weight, I will make all the rest of the weight zero. And so what you will see is that the weightless particles remain constant in time because they're zero, but the locations, they can certainly move. And so what I need to show now is that they move, but they still do not collide into each other. And you can see that even if I take many particles here and compare it with the two particle solution, still the exact same result. And so this, I will kind of quickly go over this. Uh, you can, using the fact to your advantage that the um, uh, total momentum is conserved, at some points in time, the particles can kind of cluster together because you have no control over how they move. They kind of cluster together, and then one location or one particle cannot read the other particle. And if they do, you can stop the method, redistribute the particles, and then you just start the method over again. And so you can certainly take advantage of that and redistribute the particles as you need to in order to simulate or continue simulating the solution. One other thing I want to briefly mention before I continue on is that, so yes, the particle method does you know, allow us to numerically quantify and even analytically quantify the behavior among two pecan solutions, but it turns out it's just a pretty nice method in general for simulating the so-called two pecan interaction. And so I compare this with a general finite volume method. I think this is a central semi-discrete upwind method. You see that one of the issues with this kind of smooth method is that this diffusion because of its Eulerian nature, will start to take hold of your solution as you continue on, and then you won't be able to resolve the solution as well as you could have, taking advantage that the particle method has this sort of weak formulation built into the problem, so it can give you almost a roughly exact solution to the pecan interaction, once again, realizing that the only errors will emanate from the ODE solver that you use. Here we used a uh, uh, strong stability preserving uh, third order runge cutter method to run the ODE or to solve the ODEs. And then once again, you say, well, Terrence, you already told us that the particle method is probably the bee's knees for pecan solutions because it gives you an exact solution to the equation. So it's kind of not fair that you are comparing any other method to pecan solutions because it gives you the exact solution. And once again, you're absolutely right. 
Still nice picture and still kind of showcases the advantages of using a particle method, but it's certainly right now only constrained. This is so-called not smooth initial data. This is just saying that eventually, if you take many more grid points for the finite volume method, you can kind of get this so-called numerical convergence. However, what if this time I just take arbitrarily smooth data? So this time, I'm not dealing with a pecan at all. And I just want to see what happens. This, if this doesn't convince you why the particle method is where it's at for the commercial, or what I will do to get to you. Because here, everything starts out okay, but then notice that the solution steepens as time propagates, and this actually matches a very well-known steepening theorem that Kamasa and Holm proved in the 1993 paper, which says that no matter how smooth your initial data is for the Kamasa and Holm equation, if you try to solve it, eventually you will form what is known as a so-called pecan train that will propagate. And so no matter what, you take any smooth approximation to a smooth data, eventually, as soon as it starts to steepen, it will break down. And this is why the particle method does such a really good job at resolving these type of solutions, because it does take advantage of the weak formulation of the problem to give you the solution that you want. And so just as a reminder, here's the kamasa home equation. And then to finish up, so this is the kamasa home equation. I did some analysis on it, then we turned around and did some numerics on it to show why the particle method works so nicely for the kamasa home equation. A couple of years ago, we were approached by a team of oceanographers at UCLA that was working on a, uh, on a very serious issue of modeling the propagation of tsunami waves, recalling that this equation is derived in the context of shallow water wave theory. There's been a lot of interest as whether or not these PDEs can model, not necessarily the onshore arrival, so what happens when the water gets more shallow jumps up in amplitude, and then that's when most of the destruction and, and so forth happens. But way out in the middle of the ocean, where it's just a nice smooth hump of water, traveling, of course, at a very incredible velocity, that's what generates all the energy necessary to generate that tsunami. And they have done some work beforehand, but one of the issues that they're running into was that, and you can even kind of sort of see it here, is that if you try to model the propagation of a wave for a long time, usually numerical diffusion, will eventually take hold of your problem and then will dampen the height, which will then give you a non-physically relevant issue or solution to the problem. And so they had let us know that they were working on this generalization of the kamasa home equation, which adds a continuity expression for density. And they said that we are pretty sure that this may very well serve as a viable model for the propagation of tsunami waves, at least the long time propagation before you reach onshore revival. After that, your boundary conditions change dramatically and there's some other interesting things you must do in order to get there. But they just want to try and figure out how to model it way in the ocean before it makes it to the shore. And so before I get to where that turned into, I do want to make mention something about the Kamasa home equation that I failed to mention beforehand that I feel like is an appropriate time to mention now is one of its very nice properties it has this sort of kind of bi-Hamiltonian representation and so that the equation can be described in a sort of called Hamiltonian form in two ways. Because of these two different Hamiltonian expressions you get, you also have these immediate conserved qualities that are generated from that. You've already seen this one. This is a conservation of momentum. You saw that the particle method satisfied the same thing in a, discrete, uh, in a discrete way. This is, of course, the total energy that's also conserved. And this is also another conservation property that is of interest to us. And so I, want you to keep in the back, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because then you can generalize the kamasa home equation and talk about the so-called two-component kamasa home equation. As I mentioned before, what it does, it adds a continuity expression for density, so that's rho, as a term for pressure as a source to the kamasa home equation. G, of course, is a constant acceleration of gravity constant. Alpha is still your same length scale. It also has these following conservation properties. This is momentum, this is the energy, and this is the density. 
And so this was the equation that they kind of proposed to us and wanted to see if we would be interested in doing some modeling with regards to this. They sent us over some initial data and we decided to try and write a numerical method for the two component composite home equation to see if we can garner some results and you know, kind of help them out and see whether or not this had the potential for being said model. And so one of the things that I initially got excited about one of the biggest differences between the two component Kamasa home equation and the Kamasa home equation is that this will actually generate smooth solutions. It does not yield pecan solutions like the Kamasa home equation. So as soon as I realized, nice, this yields smooth solutions, I should be able to approximate it using a you know, smooth, type, you know, finite type approximation. I decided to look at this semi-discrete central upwind scheme, very popular finite volume method for nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. And so here's the PDE, essentially the first step, you try and rewrite it in this so-called conservative form. And so notice that you can actually manipulate this PDE to get into this form here. And so I did that. We solved the PDE, numerically solved it, plugged in the initial values, tried to get a good idea of the formulation of this wave and how it propagates. And essentially, it was a colossal failure. This did not remotely work at all. And so, after a very short stint with depression and thinking that my graduate career was you know, as over just about as fast as it began, I then started to wonder what went so wrong here. It yields smooth, it yields smooth solutions. This is a very nice, well-researched, well-known numerical method for solving these type of PDEs. I got it in the conservative form, so I'm thinking that everything is good. Until I considered the fact that, well here, the game has changed a little bit. Rather than looking at a problem and then applying math to it because it's a problem or something of interest that I want to know the answer to, this time I was actually approached with a problem of physical relevancy that I need to take into account and try as much as I can to preserve that physical structure of that problem because now I'm trying to model or showcase something that's physical. And so I did not take that into account at all. I just simply said, here's my favorite method, I'm going to apply it and do work and then graduate. And then of course, that did not happen the way that I anticipated happening. And so I thought about it and I was like, well, I remember that there is these so-called conservation properties that this two-component Kamasa home equation has. And I will admit, at first when I looked at numerical methods, I did not consider these conservation properties. It was nice to have the conservation of momentum, but I needed that to prove the existence of a global weak solution. I wasn't trying to do anything physical. But this time I was. And I was thinking maybe that's why I struggled so much with trying to get this nightmare to work. And so I decided, well, let me switch my way of thinking. Maybe instead of being or thinking myself just you know, strictly pure mathematician, it's time to think I can apply a mathematician and figure out what things do I know about the problem, the physical part of the problem, that can actually embrew or implement into my numerical scheme. And maybe if I think that way, maybe, just maybe, I can simulate something of some worth for this so-called two-component Kamasa home equation. And so now you see here that my thinking now, or my goal now is to try and propose a new energy conserving finite difference scheme that will conserve those two qualities, first for the Kamasa home equation, that's my baby after all, and so I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm at least doing it on something that, that I know, hopefully know well enough to get some good results, and then trying to extrapolate those results into the two component Kamasa home equation. That was my goal. And so the one thing I was trying to keep in mind, preserve the structure, don't pay so much attention to the efficiency of your numerical scheme, don't pay so much attention to whether or not there's a quicker or better way to do this, preserve the structure, see what else will follow. So this is me trying to think like an applied mathematician now. And so, with that in mind, I decided to go with a finite difference scheme. You might wonder why, there's two reasons, one, there are many different ways to approximate a derivative. I had to play the game of figuring out how to approximate it in such a way so that it did that it conserved those energies that I was interested in conserving. That's number one. And then number two, find different schemes are fairly easy to implement. So if I can't do this, if it was wrong, then you know it shouldn't be too too much trouble to erase it, start and keep working until we can figure out the right way to concatenate these terms together to get what we want. And so, after playing around for it for a while, this was a fine different scheme that we proposed. You may see that as I runs from one to n, there's some issues here with say i plus two, 
and the I plus one and so forth and so on. Because we have the periodicity of our boundary conditions, we just sort of enforce that same periodicity for our velocity in order to resolve those issues there. So something minor, but nonetheless something that we didn't have to pay attention to. The best thing, of course, is that in space at least, the momentum is conserved. We got that from the particle method, but we don't get from the particle method the conservation as well of this energy here. And so this was a hallmark feature for this particular numerical scheme that we're going to try and implement for the two-component kamasa home equation. And of course, this works well in space, but then the question began, or became, I also need to do this in time. So not only is it important to preserve it in space, you've got to do it in time as well. And so you can do that by considering this kind of implicit midpoint method, which becomes a symplectic integrator when a system, which is important because symplectic integrators are energy preserving. And so we generate this system of linear equations between M and U. Once again, this will not be the most efficient method to solve the Kamasa home equation, but keeping in mind that's not how I was thinking here. I just wanted to preserve the structure as best as I could. And so we do that. We can, however, do a little bit better, remembering that M and U are related through that one-dimensional Hemholtz operator. This is it in its discrete form. I can rewrite M as a function of U by way of matrix multiplication, where A is given here. For those who are into matrix theory, you may notice that this matrix is diagonally dominant, so it is necessarily invertible, and so I can invert this to express U in terms of M. That allows me to recast that system of nonlinear equations entirely of M or entirely in U. And since it's a system of nonlinear equations, we decide to solve it via Newton's method. So this is now me testing it for the Kamasa home equation. I want to make sure that the total energy here is conserved. You will see uh, particle method does work in comparison to this finite difference method. But keep in mind, I actually expected to see this because these are non-smooth solutions. I'm trying to approximate it with a smooth approximation. That, of course, does not really work too well. It actually did better than I thought. But remember, this is just kind of a testing environment for the two-component Kamasa home equation, which does indeed yield smooth solutions. And so hopefully, I should be OK here. This is whatever, what I was most concerned about. Does it really preserve the energy? Thankfully, the answer is yes. And so with that said, you could wonder, well, how does preserving this energy help? So this CU, that's that semi-discrete central upwind scheme that I told you guys was a complete disaster. You see that does not preserve the energy whatsoever. This energy conserving finite difference scheme does do a fairly admirable job at keeping in touch with the total energy between what I started with initially and what happens at time t equals 20. You may ask, all right, you conserve the energy. Good job, pal in the back. But numerically, does it help? Turns out, sure does. So you kind of see here, now yes, I will admit, this isn't the greatest approximation to the true solution, but keeping in mind, that's not what I was looking for here. <clears throat> I was looking to try to preserve the energy and use this as a springboard for the two-component Kamasa home equation, which does not have this non-smoothness, so it should not run into this problem. And of course, this is poor finite volume central upwind scheme that, once again, that numerical diffusion takes over. It will certainly affect this energy conserving finite difference scheme as well. It's a Eulerian scheme. But you see that there is certainly a drastic improvement when all I did was preserve the energy. That's it. That's the only difference, roughly, between these two schemes. And so you can exactly play the exact same game with a two-component Kamasa home equation, as you see. Everything here is the exact same. The only difference, I have a source term, PIT. That was the pressure that I need to take care of here. And then I have that continuity expression for density. So that's this equation here that I need to take care of. So did that. Also, do the same exact thing in time. You discretize it. You get a system of nonlinear equations, this time in terms of uh, density and the momentum, recalling that you can rewrite the velocity in terms of the momentum. So there's really only two variables that you have to worry about. And now, finally, so we did an accuracy test on these kind of dam break initial conditions. So anytime you're working in the shallow uh, water wave uh, paradigm, usually these are the first kind of 
uh, initial conditions that you play around with to test the uh, accuracy of your scheme. And you see here, this, and I thought about putting in those, uh, the ones that I did for the semi discrete central upwind scheme. That's gonna bring back a lot of so I decided not to do that and just show you guys the good stuff. But believe me, this by far looks infinitely better than what happened when I tried to uh, implement the semi-discrete central upwind scheme to this problem. And so this is, this is velocity, this is the density, and then we just kind of did a preservation of the Hamiltonian test to check to see if the energy was conserved. It certainly is. And so just to kind of give a recap, you saw I started an analysis and it somehow made my way to modeling the propagation of tsunami waves. And so it's been you know, very interesting uh, last couple of years, and which I wouldn't trade for anything. This, you know, I think it's probably some of the most amazing stuff ever. I might be a little biased, but I think it's the case. And the thing that is even interesting is that the story is actually continuing as we speak. So right now, uh, I'm working with a, a student. Uh, when I took the position at Drake, uh, he actually came to my job talk and he said, you know, if you were to ever come here, I immediately want to work with you. And so I actually just started a couple of weeks ago looking at a convergence analysis of the particle method for a modified. So the regular Kamasa home equation has a quadratic nonlinearity. The modified Kamasa home equation has a cubic nonlinearity. And so they're very uh, interesting solution dynamic and solution behavior. There's been a lot of work done analytically with regards to this equation, not much work done numerically, and so uh, he's starting to work on that. It is actually my hope. So he'll be a junior uh, this coming up semester uh, doing an independent study with him. Hopefully I can get him to come to the next CARMS. He's one of the few minority students that we have at Drake University, and so that's, uh, that's gonna be a goal of mine. So hopefully you'll hear his name here next summer. Uh, we've been uh, so slowly but surely working on this kind of long time tsunami wave propagation. Now that we have a viable numerical method that actually preserves the energy, and so I've been working with the student at Iowa State, Emily Carr, on that. And then finally, uh, that finite difference method of energy preserving worked very well. However, one of the issues is that it's kind of a low order method because it's just finite difference. So the best you can hope for is second order accuracy for smooth solutions. And so we just have to bump the order up by looking at the kind of high order approximation of a finite difference called the Galerkin method. And so we've been looking at this energy Galerkin method, energy conserving Galerkin method for the two component Kamasa home equation. And this is with my uh, uh, postdoc mentor, uh, Howling Liu at Iowa State University. And so the story, you know, still continues. This is uh, some of the stuff that I'm uh, working on now. Just about finished with this. We should have that paper submitted by hopefully next week or so. But in any case, I kind of just wanted to kind of take out time. It's very rare that I get a whole entire hour to talk about math. And so I figured I'll kind of do my survey talk to kind of tell you guys, you know, where I've been, where I'm going, where I hope to continue to go as I continue working uh, uh, in this research field and in this research area. And so I do want to thank you guys for your attention to this talk. It's been a blast and every conference conference I come, it's always an amazing experience. Uh, these are some of the collaborators I've worked on with some of the projects I mentioned before. This is my PhD advisor. These are some of our collaborators from Tulane and Duke. I uh, forgot to put the people from uh, UCLA, the oceanographers there. And of course, Carmen 22 for inviting me to come here. So thank you guys. <laughs>